This is Gardening in America, and I'm Ed Hume. Today we're in Boise, Idaho, and we're at the Idaho Botanical Gardens, and I'm with the director, Judy Outerkirk. Judy, what part of uh, Boise is the Botanical Garden located? Okay, be first, before I tell you that, I want to welcome you to the Idaho Botanical oh, Garden. thank you. We are so thrilled to have you here this morning. And so that people will know how to find us, we're on the east side of town, and we're located next to the old Idaho Penitentiary. So we're pretty easy to find. And what part of the garden are we in here? Okay, actually, we are very centrally located. This little cottage, this deck, and the uh, plaza is right in the center so that all events that take place here, people can fan out and see uh, the garden. Then we are surrounded by, oh, the iris garden, the peony garden, the rose garden, the English garden. But right now, we're just standing right in the middle. And uh, when did the garden open? Yeah, the garden first opened back, uh, actually, for site, it opened in 1988, but it was started in 1984. It was the vision of Dr. Christopher Davidson, who grew up here in Boise. Oh, wow. And he uh, surrounded himself with some volunteers who were willing to come out and move dirt, put in all this sandstone. At one time, I have to tell you, Ed, this was nothing more than a brown foothill. Oh, wow. And these people came out uh, with their own equipment and dug the ditches, put in the steps, all planted the flowers, all the major work in those early years was done by volunteers. Wow, and that's been done within the past 10 years, yes, basically. Yes, it has, basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. When's mm -hmm. the best time to visit the gardens? Oh, that, that, you know, that's such a question for a, a <laughs> botanical a director because when, I, I would like, I want people to be here all year round because sure. I want them to come see the flowers in the winter, but I, or in the summer, but I want them to come and, and cross country ski through our garden in the winter. Oh. So you see, there's lots of things there's to do. But in the spring, everything is pastel. It's light in color, uh, light shades of pink and yellow uh. and uh, wonderful uh, lightness and even the greens are light. Then as you move through the summer and you come into the heat, of course, and we move towards fall, now you can see we've got the deep, rich greens, the purples, the deep reds, the rusts, the golds. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and then I have to say, we'll move on through this flower period into snow. And there is just nothing like a garden under a layer of snow. Botanical gardens are often just plants and not too interesting. Here you've done a magnificent job of okay. adding color and showing yes. the consumer how plants can be used in the in their own gardens. Yes. So it's an educational garden and I know you have a, a real education program here too and anyone that comes to Boise you've got to put a must visit for the Idaho Botanical Gardens next to the penitentiary, the old penitentiary right here in Boise. Thanks very much Judy. Well thank you. It's time to think about wintering your geraniums. You know, you have to bring them in before that first frost in fall. And here's one that I've just taken out of the garden, put into a pot. And the reason why I did that, I think this is so beautiful. I'd bring it in as a potted plant and enjoy it until it's through flowering and then winter it. So what I'll do is just clean it up a little bit by taking off those old blossoms and any of the leaves. See, here's a leaf that doesn't look too good. I think I'd take that off. And I also would do one other thing before you bring any plant into the home. Always look at the leaves, particularly the undersides of the leaves, to be sure that there are no insects. There's a little moisture on this, and that may look like insects to you, but it's, it's just moisture from outdoors. You can actually put this in a family room, or you could put it in a semi-heated garage, anywhere where the temperature's above freezing. That's a great place to winter geraniums. I like to do it in the crawl space under the house. And then you only check them all about once every four to six weeks to see whether or not they need water. That's about all you need to do. Now, how do you do it otherwise? Well, the first thing you do when it's through flowering, and this has lots of buds, so it's kind of going to be pretty for a while. But nevertheless, I'm going to get it ready for winter. And is what we actually do is to go in and cut back the foliage like so. Now, we'll let the rest of the foliage die back, and as it does, we'll pick it off. Now that's one way. Another way is to do this. 
And I can tell you, this never works for me. But lots of people say it works very, very effectively for them. And that is that you take it out of the soil, you bare root it completely, and you can wash this off to continue or to end the whole procedure. And then you pick off the leaves of the geranium, like so. And then you can do several different things. You can put this in a paper bag if you want to, or you can also hang it upside down in a cool, well-ventilated place. And you've got to be sure it's above freezing, remember, but hang it upside down like that. And that's another way in which to winter the geraniums, or in a paper bag, either way. So if you want to save those geraniums, this is a good time to get started. Now, what about some of this growth here that we have here, for example? We could take this little growth and just leave the top leaves, dip it into a little bit of redding hormone, and usually we let this set for oh, about uh, three or four hours, and then just put it into a uh, container, and I'm using vermiculite in that case, start a new young plant for next year too. But now's the time to get after those geraniums and get them into their winter resting place. This is a great time to eliminate those weeds in the garden before they flower and go to seed. Here's a perfect example right here. Look at here all the seed heads formed already from the flowers that are gone. This plant will just spread seed throughout this entire garden. So if we can eliminate them at this time of the year, we can really cut down on problems a little bit later on. Here's another good example. See there, once again, all the seeds are just ready to spread throughout this whole garden. And once a lot of these weeds have gone to seed, you'll fight those weed seeds for seven years up to a hundred years. So get them out before they have a chance to continue to flower and go to seed. Here's another good example. And this is Oxalis. Look at the flowers on this. And there are probably some seed heads too. Yeah, there are a few seed heads as well. So let's get it out. Now, since I'm talking about Oxalis, let me go over here to another type of Oxalis, right here along the edge of the walkway. And let me dig this up just to give you an idea of what happens here on Oxalis. See the, the bulbs in the, or corms in the soil there? That's why I dug that out, to be sure that I got them all. Otherwise, it, we generally just tend to cut them off and then first thing we know, the corms will keep sending up foliage and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's eliminate them completely. So we'll just take a minute here and kind of clean this whole garden area up and get those weeds out before they have a chance to flower. Look at back here is another problem. Actually, it's not a problem, it's a benefit. Because we've got a situation where we've got a des an undesirable plant, but we also have two desirable plants. So it's what we have to do is kind of try to go in a little bit carefully and get out this columbine. See, that's what that is. It's going to have beautiful flowers in springtime. And also in here is a snapdragon. So let's try to save those two if we possibly can. But at the same time, clean out the rest of the area. So I'll quickly put those right back in. And the soil is moist, but I'll still water it in a little bit. Whoops. Like so. Okay. Now, we've saved the two desirable plants, but at the same time, we've got rid of the real troublesome wheat. And look here, in just a short period of time, just a couple minutes here, I've gotten that area all ready to look a lot better, and I've eliminated the potential of them flowering and going to seed and really becoming a nuisance in the garden. And now is a perfect time to get out and get after those weeds so that they don't spread their seeds all over the garden area.
there are quite a few things you can do in the garden at this time of the year to make it look a little bit better. This is a fall aster. Isn't that beautiful? It's been gorgeous for weeks. But the problem is we had rain and of course the poor plant just fell apart. I quickly came out and knocked the water off of the blossoms and they sprung right back up. But it still should be staked and that's a project that I'm going to do today. Uh, it's very easy, of course, just to put a string around them and a stake to hold them in place. But if you don't do that, let me give you an example of what happens with that chrysanthemum there in the foreground. Because the rain got on it, I, I tried to take the water off of the flowers, but nevertheless, they're double and, and they were just too heavy and they fell apart. So a little bit of staking makes all the difference in the world. And this is the time that you want to give a little attention to those kind of projects. Now, I also want you to notice the overall effect of this bed because there are several things that are really important. Foliage color, for example, foliage texture and flower color. And this has a little bit of all of it. So I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. Back here, there's a plant you can't see but I'm going to cut the blossoms so you can. This is a Hebe. And by the way, is what I often do in the garden is when I plant a plant and I'm not familiar with the particular variety, I put the stake or the label right with the plant. In some cases, I even bury it in the ground with the plant. So let me just look down here and see what we can find out. This is a variety called Hebe Maria, M-A-R-I-A. So right away then I know what the variety is. Here's another variety, by the way, back here, that's the variegated Hebe. And that's simply all it's called is variegated Hebe. But here's one that I want to share with you that I think is just spectacular. And that is the tricolor. This has been that color all year long. Just beautiful and it has required no pruning. Now, speaking of pruning, here's a plant that does need a little bit of pruning and it's the Dusty Miller. You can see there that it's beginning to go to flower. So let's go back in here a little ways and cut this back. And I'm gonna cut this one back so it's in proportion. See now the entire plant is in proportion and that little bit of pruning will make all the difference in the appearance of the garden at this time of the year. And here's something else. See here, this is a marguerite daisy and look at these buds, late as it is in the season, still trying to form. So is what we want to do is to go in and cut off all of these old flowers so that the plant does not go to seed and continues to try to flower. And I think if you have just observed those few things in your landscape, foliage color, foliage texture, and flower color, you can come up with some outstanding plantings. And now's the time to spend a little time observing the garden. We're in Meridian, Idaho, and I'm with Jan Veach, Advanced Master Gardener. Jan, in the vegetable garden here, what do you grow at this time of the year? Um, you can do late crops of lettuce, you can do um, radishes, um, lots of things, uh, second cropping. Uh -huh. Can you do anything over winter? Um, not unless you have a cold frame over it. Some of my friends do that, lettuces and so forth, with little cold frames over yeah. them. So that's possible, yeah. Because you have a fairly harsh climate here oh, yeah. in, in oh, Meridian, yeah. don't you? Yeah. Um, now, I noticed that you have one bed of corn that's gone over, and yet you have another bed that's coming on. Are those different varieties or just different planting times? No, it's just different uh, planting times. They're the same variety, but that's just part of the succession planting. I noticed also here in the garden a couple things. One is uh, you have a scarecrow back here. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's in my son's bed. He has a uh, bed that we tell him that's his and he plants it however he likes and puts whatever he likes in it. How do you like the raised beds? I really do. Um, it's so much easier to control the soils in, in the bed. In fact, they are um, somewhat of a soilless mixture. They're not native soil. Sure. Uh, but they drain well. They, they hold heat well. Um, the plants just do much better and plus it's at a good height for you know harvesting and so forth. Oh right. I noticed that you've used a very dark black in fact mulch. What kind of mulch is that? That is um, the residue left over from mint being processed. Oh. It's called mint sludge and it's oh. kind of like it looks like a dry hay yeah. material. 
Yeah. And does that mix in as a good uh, organic humus, or do you use it just as a summer oh, yeah. mulch? Oh yeah, and the great thing about it, it's, it's sterile, so you don't have a lot of weeds and so forth in it. Um, assuming it doesn't sit in a pile over a long period of time and weeds blow into it, I mean sure. seeds, but uh, it provides a really good mulch and uh, also breaks down. So if you work it into the soil or even just leave it, it eventually breaks down and really does oh. a good amendment to the soil. Wonderful. Now in between the beds here, you've used uh, something to suppress the weeds as well. Right. Old carpet, um, preferably um, jute backed because that way the, the um, water will go ahead and pass through it, but it sure helps in keeping the weeds oh, down. Oh, wow, I guess. Yeah. Now the fence behind us, very quickly, you've used a couple of plants that are most interesting. Um, actually, two different kinds of grasses, uh, or ornamental grasses, which are very popular these days. And uh, an old-fashioned plant, uh, lots of people have seen around, they're castor beans. Yeah, very And that's pretty. the bronze variety. I guess oh, there's a the green yeah. variety, but they're just very attractive, very tropical looking. And then on the house, you have a very attractive vine as well. Lots of different things, uh, clematis, morning glory. Yeah, the morning glory is what I noticed right. particularly. Right. Thanks for sharing your garden with us. Sure. We enjoy that very much. Beautiful garden here in Meridian, Idaho. We have two interesting plants of the week. First of all, Little Rascal Holly and Icy Blue Juniper. The Little Rascal Holly is one of these interesting plants that turns color during the winter. In fact, the foliage on this one will turn bronze. It's starting to turn a little bit bronze already, but then as the weather gets colder, this will turn purple and it's gorgeous. What a nice plant. Grows best in full sun or part sun and shade. Now, this plant only grows about two feet high, but it'll spread about three feet wide. So it's an ideal plant to use as a low hedge, or you could use it in a container, or you can use it anywhere in the landscape. It has a few barbs under it, so it could even be a security plant, maybe under a window, a low window around the home. So it has lots of uses. It's hardy to 30 degrees below zero. So it's a very, very hardy variety as well and it's evergreen. So it has many, many benefits. Now, keep in mind that this should be fertilized with a rhododendron type fertilizer in late winter, and if any pruning needs to be done, it's best done in early spring. And then our icy blue juniper. Oh, this is a gorgeous variety. This winter color is outstanding. It's beautiful all year long, but particularly during the summer season. It's probably the best of the silver blue junipers. And as you can see, it's very, very low growing. So it makes an excellent ground cover plant. Or once again, it could be used in the general landscape and it can also be used in containers, you know, so it's a very versatile type of juniper. And keep in mind, it's very hardy too. It'll grow only about four inches high, but it will spread up to a width of about eight feet. Now, both of these plants are available at your local nursery or garden center. We're up in the northwest part of the state of Washington, and I'm at Merritt Apples today, and I'm with Alan Merritt. Whereabouts is Merritt Orchards? Well, we're about uh, 10 miles west of Mount Vernon, uh, eight miles west of Burlington, along the shores of Padilla Bay. Oh, yeah. Now, we're talking about apples. How do you know when an apple's ready to eat? Well, the best thing to do is pick it and uh, slice it, and if it's juicy and it has some brown seeds and it's edible, it's ready to eat. It's okay. Now, the old idea that a few fall on the ground doesn't have anything to do with when to pick them? Or? Well, it can. Uh, some varieties drop very easily. Uh, Gravenstein and um, King are very, very easily dropped. So are Spartan. Okay, so that maybe isn't the best. Not yet. the best indication. There, we have about a dozen varieties here, some, many of which you grow. What's your favorite? I think John Gold, hands down, is my favorite. It's, it's the apple we have the, the most of, but it's, uh, it has so many uses. It's, a, it's an excellent cooking apple, excellent eating apple, baking it's in juice. It just has every, every attribute. Yeah, it's a, a gorgeous apple, too. It's this one right here. What about Mer Melrose? Is that a good apple? It's a very good apple. It's, a, it's similar to John Gold. It has Jonathan Heritage, 
and it's a Jonathan Cross of the Red Delicious. Now we're in western Washington and I see a variety here called Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> Does that grow well here? It grows very well. It's a chance seedling from California. It's a golden delicious type apple. Very good keeping apple and it's a delicious uh, dessert apple. Oh wow. I noticed two, two old timers here. King and in front of us here Gravenstein. Yes. Uh, how do you judge those? Well Gravenstein is a summer apple. Yes. And it's our main summer apple. We have a wide distribution of Gravenstein. It's an excellent sauce apple, cooking apple, and uh, it's a good eating apple also. King is an old, old favorite. Yeah. Um, comes from England, I believe, and it's, a, it's, it's your basic old winter apple. Yeah, it's a good variety too. Now, we come on to a few other varieties. For example, Liberty. Well, Liberty is a disease-resistant apple. It can be grown in a, in a homeowner's yard. Oh, wow. with very very little to no care. It's resistant to scab and mildew. It, it bears heavily and it's, it's just a nice apple. It's a dessert apple, not a cooking apple, I believe. Yeah, a Macintosh, Spartan, John Mac? Yes, these are all Macintosh parentage apples. Uh, John and Mac is, of course, Jonathan Macintosh, Spartan is, um, is uh, Macintosh and Newton. And then here's your old uh, Macintosh. What about Gala? Well, Gala is a popular apple from uh, New Zealand. It's strictly a dessert apple. It's a very sweet and crispy. Has a um, oh mid-September picking time. Uh, very nice tree to grow. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing all these different varieties mm -hmm. with us and and giving our viewers an idea of some of the great apples that they could grow in their own garden. That's all the time we have today. Hope you can join me next time for Gardening in America. Mm -hmm.